I want to understand, first of all, how much power President Xi has domestically within this party, because a lot of people from the outside looking in right now, Bob, they're struggling to gauge that. What do you see? Well, there have been three powerful leaders uh, of that level uh, since the uh, founding of the People's Republic. One was clearly Mao Zedong, the other was Deng Xiaoping, and the third is Xi Jinping. So he has an enormous amount of power, and he's structured the government in such a way that he has created a lot of these small committees or small standing committees, as he calls them, and he chairs most of them. So he really is at the center of every major decision. The party's role has become much stronger. In every major company, virtually every major company, there is now a strong party committee um, working with the CEO and um, working with the leaders of the company. And almost every major decision of a big company has to go through that Communist Party committee within the company. And if it's a bigger decision than that, it has to go through the party structure in Beijing. Xi Jinping has talked a lot about common prosperity. How bad is common prosperity for the overall Chinese economy? Or could it be actually something that works in tandem with ongoing and more normalized growth? Well, that's the point. Um, that it, there are two reasons for this notion of common prosperity. One is that they are, over a period of time, going to be running short on workers, as we are in some sectors. And so as a result, they have to bring in uh, people from the countryside to the cities so they can get jobs. They have to resettle them. And those people tend to earn a lot more in the cities than they did in, in the farm areas. The second is, is that they are quite aware of the fact that the Communist Party will be strengthened um, and the, the next several months, I think, will we'll demonstrate this by upping the prosperity of low-income people. Most of them live in small, medium-sized villages, so to the extent you can broaden access to wireless uh, communications and a number of other things, uh, bring more um, immunization and, 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 and various types of medical care, to regional China, that will help too. But they do not want to have a big divide between the wealth of the eastern cities of China and the lower levels of income in central and western China. They think that will be very divisive uh, to the party and to the country. So they're trying to narrow that gap. Bob, what does this mean for China's role as the factory to the world if wages have to go up, if people are moving to cities and looking to be paid a lot more than they have been in the past? Well, it certainly will raise the price of goods that the Chinese produce, uh, and uh, that will add to uh, inflationary pressures both in China and in the countries that China supplies. Uh, the other thing that it will do is raise the price in particular of, uh, of, of housing in China, because in China now they have these things called hukos, which are little groups within each village and or, or each community in the big cities. And they have limited the number of people coming in. When you get more and more people coming in, they're going to be buying more uh, more apartments. So you're going to see prices go up in, um, in the real estate sector as well. That affects Chinese, not us. But in general, the price levels of Chinese supplies to the United States will go up as a result of this. Bob, I just finished reading Admiral Stravitas's novel, 2034. I thought it was incredibly exciting, and clearly it's fictional, but every time I hear news now about tensions between China and Taiwan or Taiwan uh, relying on the U.S., I start to worry a little more than I have in the past. Where are we right now in terms of those relationships? Well, Jim Stravitas is a very old friend. I went to Fletcher. He was dean of Fletcher. We've been friends for, for decades. This is a guy who is writing fiction, but has a really firm basis in reality because of his knowledge. And he has particularly, um, being a naval, naval admiral, uh, a lot of um, experience in the Pacific Basin. Uh, there clearly are tensions rising between China and uh, Taiwan, Xi Jinping has been talking more about more and more about unification. Uh, I don't think he's going to take any action 
right away. But I, I do think that if you're looking for potential flashpoints in the global system over the next um, five to 10 years, that's certainly something one has to uh, watch. And the United States has to figure out how it's going to play that as well. The United States has said it would uh, provide China, uh, Taiwan with um, equipment that it needs to defend itself if there were more tensions there and things got hotter, it puts the United States in a very difficult position. Does it want to get, well, and to what extent does it want to get involved? And and creates globally a new paradigm, right? Um, how much uh, do we have to pay attention to China's military capabilities? Well, we do. You've seen these new hypersonic missiles that they have just unveiled. These are formidable weapons. Uh, the Chinese have put a lot of money into strengthening their military capability and their cyber capability as well. So we have to look at China, not so much that China is going to threaten the United States today. And, and I think we shouldn't categorize China as an enemy, um, as some people are doing, because that's just going to push it to take tougher and tougher positions um, that we will find objectionable. The, the problem is that we've been used to having a lot of influence in the Western Pacific. The Chinese now, with these small islands that they've developed into Air Force bases, uh, strengthening the role of the PLA Navy in the South China Sea, making more claims. Um, we, we're gonna have to pay more attention to their building out their influence in, in, the, uh, in the Pacific region. And the Quad, which involves Japan, Australia, and of course, uh, the United States and India yeah. uh, is designed to help counter uh, some of that influence. But um, we're going to have to do a lot to provide a counterweight to the Chinese, not to contain them, because we're not going to be able to do that. They're going to grow. They're going to become more powerful militarily, technologically. But we can give other countries in the region an alternative so that they work with the United States, yeah. both on trade and on military and security issues. Bob, just real quick here, you've worked uh, through decades for many administrations uh, in various capacities. Do you think that this administration is doing a good job when it comes to U.S.-China relations? Well, I think this administration has a good strategy, and that is, first of all, it's building up relations with its allies. Uh, the Trump administration had a lot of friction with allies it needed in order to strengthen uh, America's position and the West's position in the Pacific and in Europe and in elsewhere. So building those alliances, strengthening confidence is important. Second, um, our, our new trade representative um, is going to have to find ways of getting us back into the game on trade. We, we mistakenly, in my judgment, dropped out of the TPP. Now we have to demonstrate that we have staying power not just from a military point of view, but from a trade point of view, we're going to be a more active partner to, to these countries. So we're going to have to move on that. And we're also going to have to realize that China is going to be a big power. It's going to be with us for a long time and figure out some framework for working with China on um, climate issues, on potentially future pandemics, uh, making sure the international financial system uh, works well, particularly when all this debt that's been accumulated over the last several years uh, has to get paid off by emerging economies. So we're going to have to figure out how to work with the Chinese. They're building alliances, relationships, friendships that support us and that we support is, I think, the, the first step in the process. Second, finding areas where we do have common interests. And third, beginning to move toward China. I don't think there's any rush to do it, but I do think it has to be on the agenda for the next couple of years. You can't ignore and you can't have a confrontation with the second biggest, most powerful country in the world without some ramifications. And if it doesn't work and if there is a confrontation, then um, it's it's really a a, a weakening um, for for both sides. It's yeah. it's, it's 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 harmful. Uh, to the United States. It's mutually assured disruption for us and for China.